Khatabaat and welcome to another edition of our weekly Torah classes. And if you're logging on to ohelsara.com or to Torah Anytime, or if you're a devoted YouTube subscriber, we thank you so very much for so for being so diligent and so committed to your souls, to your neshamot. For those Baruch who should continue to bless your path, give you tremendous bracha v'atzlacha b'chol ma'asei yadichem, in all of your ways. A dedication, a few dedications we have to answer amen to, so important. Please don't fast forward, I keep saying this. The opportunity to say amen when someone is giving a blessing is so special. Maybe one day very soon I'm going to give a class on the power of the word Amen. But we have an opportunity over here to bless certain people and to, to pray on their behalf. So please don't skip these parts, so important. So first of all, a refuah shlema. We wish a speedy recovery to Yair Emanuel Ben Gavriela. A refuah shlema to Sarah Bat Hana and to Nahara Bat Liba. We also want and hope for an Ilui Neshama, the elevation of the soul of Ruth Bad Ber that I mentioned last week. It's just that uh, um, the person who donated money on her behalf emailed us after we mentioned her name. She was this amazing woman from England who had no children. Alea Shalom. But she had many students who she treated like her children and she was well known in England as a pianist. Sadly she passed away recently so we hope that she has an elevation in the heavens. Mincha Devora Bat Miriam Shoshana in Ilui Neshama also for her her uh, soul should be elevated. Yulia Bat Helena also in Ilui Neshama and of course the Ilui Neshama of Annalise and Werner Volmar and his special dedication by their daughter. Ashley, thank you so much for always being such a generous donor and contributor to Ohel Sara. We want to wish and pray for Hatzlacha, a tremendous success for Tzipora Yael Batsara, who just came back back, I guess, to America, from a Torah year filled with spirituality here in Eretz Yisrael. We wish her a lot of success and the happiness in all her ways. And of course, <coughs> a tremendous Hatzlacha, success to Ruth Jagdeo. Um, someone gave a donation, Frances Waldman actually. Uh, she, you know, Ruth was recently here, I don't know if you remember. We wish you tremendous atlacha, Ruth, especially to your son, that this year should be uh, proved to be a miraculous one in all ways. Also, we hope and we pray for Yirat Shamaim, for heavenly reverence and love of Hashem, for Chaim ben Rivka. And there was a special dedication to all of Israel and the nations at large that we should all come to have an awe of Hashem and a love for Him. A special thank you to Greta Johnson, all your dedications and memos and your love of Hashem and His Torah. We appreciate it so much. Thank you to Kellyanne O'Neill from Australia for your heartfelt donation and your memo. And of course to Raquel Fernandez de Salvo, thank you so much for your dedication. Listen to the dedication that all Am Yisrael should have the merit to see the Bet HaMikdash, the Temple, and Yerushalayim rebuilt with the coming of Mashiach soon. And a special dedication from Nevada and Espen Lee Berg from Norway who gave a generous donation for their dear son in dedication of their dear son, Oliver Gavriel. And uh, they left in the memo, listen, what, a beautiful, what beautiful words, that there should be an upsurge of listeners from all the quarters of the earth. That's right, we want more and more listeners and more followers. But Hashem, Hashem is so good. And thank you to Anat Zalmanovich, 
from Melville, New York, for your uh, support and your contribution. Some of you don't put your email in the memo, so I, I can't send you back a receipt, so I have to mention you. Thank you, Anat. Okay. My dear friends, this Shi'u has been sponsored by Galit Yam Bat Gavriela and her siblings, David Eyal Ben Gavriela, Liel Eden Bat Gavriela, and the husband of her mother, Tzvi Ben Batia. They all sponsored this lecture that is going to be dedicated in memory and for the Ilui Neshama of their mother and the wife, Gavriela Bat Tzvi Alea Shalom. May every single lesson that's imparted in this lecture, any spiritual elevation that you all gain from this lecture be an Ilui Neshama for this woman who passed away, Gavriela Bat Tzvi Alea Hashalom. We wish the family also tremendous success. Thank you so much for your sponsorship. And Be'ezat Hashem HaKadosh Baruch who should bless you with a year of mazal, of good fortune, bracha, blessings, v'atzlacha, and success in all your ways. Thank you so much. And I have to say special thank you to all those who have been donating for our Rosh Hashanah, actually our, our, our holiday campaign, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Aseret Yemei Tshuva, Sukkot. We have so many donation opportunities and so many of you, Baruch Hashem, are taking advantage of it that when you click the donate button, you're actually designating where you want your donation to go. So first of all, thank you to all of you who have been donating to the needy families that we are going to help support through the Chagim. Thank you so much for those who have made donations to our local mikveh here in Ramah Aleph, the mikveh Maim Chaim, also, thank you so much for all of those who, who made a sponsorship for our upcoming event next week, Monday, Be'ezat Hashem. It's still not too late to be a part of that event and to sponsor it. And it should be in your schut that anybody who's coming to that event will have a spiritual elevation, will be in your merit. For all those who have sponsored lectures recently, thank you so much. And most of all, for all those who are clicking on what? Sponsorship of Torah hours. Some of you have sponsored 100 hours of Torah, 500 hours of Torah, 1,000 hours of Torah, 2,000 hours, 4,000 hours. All of those hours combined of lectures that have already been posted, lectures that will be posted, that you are sponsoring are yours for all eternity. It's still not too late to log on to ohelsara.com and make your designated donation in honor of the upcoming holiday, of the upcoming Day of Judgment, Rosh Hashanah, and let it be a merit. Let it stand as a merit in the heavens for all of you that this year should be filled with bracha, with blessings, with shefa, with an abundance of good, with protection. We all need protection. We're going to need protection this year. With, with merits with health and sustenance because we are just a week and a half away from the great and awesome days of Yemei Haddin, the days of judgment and somehow <coughs> when these days appear on the calendar judgment is the only thing that preoccupies our minds you know there was a time in America when the three most frightening letters in the English alphabet, letters that used to cause people a great deal of stress and panic were IRS, the Internal Revenue Service. The IRS is the department that oversees and makes certain that we pay our taxes. Nobody wants to receive a letter from the IRS informing them that they're being audited even the most honest person with the best accountant cannot defeat the IRS agents who somehow find some minute indiscretion. And that's why people are nervous when the IRS examines their transactions. The person who's audited, 
He can't sleep. He can't eat. His days are concerned with thoughts of what the outcome is going to be. That's how seriously we used to take the IRS. But the day of Rosh Hashanah and all the days that follow it are much more serious because during the Yemei Haddin, during the days of judgment, it's not only your financials that are on the line. Your entire existence is hanging in the balance. The list of life and all its amenities is the judgment that we face on Rosh Hashanah. Nobody's exempt from this judgment. Therefore, I want to discuss a few important ideas as a preparation for these awesome days. So today, I am going to reveal one of the secrets of Rosh Hashanah. Chachamim tell us, and actually before I even reveal this secret to you, I want you all to stop for a moment. If you have a Tanakh, a Torah, Nevi'im and Ketuvim book in your library, go get it. If you have a Sefer Devarim, or if you just have a Sefer Devarim, the book of Deuteronomy, get it. It has to be in Hebrew though. Because unfortunately, the English version, when I say the English version, I mean from the secular world, does not have what we're going to learn today. Go back to the original. You pull out that book and turn to Sefer Devarim. Specifically, Parashat Nitzavim. Because we're going to learn some fascinating, a fascinating idea. Chachamim tell us, that there are actually four periods of the year that were designated for judgment. And these four periods are for four different types of people. The first period of judgment is Rosh Hashanah. Who's judged on Rosh Hashanah? Which Jew is affected on Rosh Hashanah? Rabbanim inform us that Tzaddikim Gmurim, the wholesome righteous, are judged on Rosh Hashanah. Their judgment is signed, sealed, and delivered on that day. Of course, we know that in general, the entire world is being judged. Everybody, from the animals even, to the human beings, to everyone, the whole world, every country, every leader. But specifically, Hashem has a, a, a focus <clears throat> on the wholesome righteous. <clears throat> Their judgment is signed, sealed, and delivered on that day. Now we're told that a tzaddik gamur only needs the 30-day period of Elul, which is now, in order to receive his final judgment, which means he only needs 30 days to clean up shop. After all, how polluted could his house be? He probably has just a few crumbs lying around somewhere. He doesn't have that many sins that he, he accumulated throughout the year. So the tzaddik Amur can do what we call the 30-day program, and once Rosh Hashanah has rolled around, he could feel fully prepared to go into the day of judgment. Now that's nice, but where do we fall into this picture? We, you and I, are what the Gemara calls Benonim. Benonim are the mediocre people we're not perfect tzaddikim, we're not perfectly righteous, but we're not perfect reshaim either. We're not entirely evil. So we're somewhere in the middle. Sometimes we do mitzvot, and sometimes we do averot, sometimes we sin. Sometimes we do engage in the observance of the commandments and we are engaged in good deeds. And sometimes uh, we're not so careful, we sin. We, we create indiscretions against God, against one another. Chachamim tell us that the Benonim, who are really the majority of the people, they need more than 30 days to prepare for the days of judgment. They actually need 40 days. They need the 30 days of Elul plus the 10 days of Aseret Yemei Tshuva, the 10 days of repentance between Rosh Hashanah and Yom HaKippurim. 
Because the Benonim have more residual sins in their pocket, obviously it's going to take them longer to cleanse themselves. Our judgment, the judgment of the Benonim, is finalized on Yom Kippur at the end of the day with the tefillah, with the prayer of Ne'ilah. That's why at the end of the davening on Yom Kippur, we change the language from Ketiva to Khatima from being inscribed in the Book of Life to being sealed in the Book of Life. We understand that by, by the end of Yom Kippurim, our judgment has now been khatum. It's been sealed. So the Benonim, we need the 40-day program. But then the Zohar Kadosh tells us about another program which is for all those people who still have some sins hanging from the fringes of their garments even after Yom Kippur. Even though they did make efforts to try and cleanse themselves of their sins, they're so sullied that they weren't able to complete the job in that 40-day period. These people need an extension. And when does their extension end? On Shmini Atzeret on the eighth day of Sukkot. The night before Shmini Atzeret is Hoshana Rabbah. Many people on that night stay up learning and davening and praying. The tefillot, the prayers are very long. There are hakafot. We, we, we dance around the, the, uh, the bima in the, in the synagogue. We clap the aravot. There's a feeling of Yom Kippur in the end, even though it's Sukkot. Why? Because all those people who are still lagging behind and needed more time still have one last opportunity to receive a good judgment that will be finalized on the eighth day of Sukkot. And how many days is this program? It's a 52-day program. So we have the 30-dayers, the 40-dayers, and we have the 52-day regimen which brings us now to Shmini Atzeret, the eighth day of Sukkot. Now, you might not believe this, but for the last minute shoppers, for those who were busy with nonsense other than doing real teshuva, and they therefore were not able to attain the ultimate mechila v'selicha, the ultimate forgiveness and atonement, you know what the Svarim HaKadoshim, what the Holy Books say about these people? For those who need more time, where after this fourth time period, that's it, there's no more clemency, those people have until the eighth day of Hanukkah. Could you believe this? Now, I have to make a disclaimer over here and tell you, please don't get it into your heads that, oh, you know what, I have until the, the last day of Hanukkah to do tshuva. No, no, because Hashem takes that into consideration too. You have to do your very best to get ready for the day of judgment when that day of judgment falls out, which is Rosh Hashanah, and through Aseret Yom tshuva, and even Yom Kippurim. We don't postpone our repentance. We try to create the repentance when the days of repentance fall out on the calendar. But still, that Hashem even allows an opening for those latecomers is miraculous. Here we thought, by the way, that we're only going to discuss Rosh Hashanah. And instead, look how we're moving along in the calendar all the way to Hanukkah. My dear students, the eighth day, the eighth day of Hanukkah is a very special day. That day is referred to as Zot Hanukkah. This is Hanukkah, and the Pasuk concerning that time period states, Bezot Yechupar Avon Yaakov. On the day of Zot, which is the eighth day of Hanukkah, the sins of Yaakov will be atoned for. We're taught that just like on Hanukkah, the Kohen Gadol, the high priest, found a small jug of oil that had the seal of one of the previous Kohanim Gdolim on it, so too with the, the eighth day of Hanukkah. Hashem, who is the greatest Kohen Gadol, takes one of his flasks of oil, so to speak, 
the flask of oil which represents the Jewish nation and he seals the judgment of all those people who needed more time during the days of awe. How many days is that program? Well, from Rosh Chodesh Elul to the eighth day of Hanukkah, if you count, is a total of 122 days. So we have this, I want you to write this down. We're going to see it on the screen as well. We have this important concept of the four time periods. The 30 days of Elul, 40 days Elul plus Aseret Emetshuva, the 52 days up until Shmini Atzeret, and the 122 days that lead up to the eighth day of Hanukkah. So I'm thinking, such an important concept it has to be alluded to in the Torah itself. Not in the commentaries, in the Torah itself. Well, guess what? This is why I wanted you guys to get your books out. Open up Sefer Devarim. The parasha that we always read the week before Rosh Hashanah is Parashat Nitzavim. Now, I don't know if you guys ever noticed, but at the end of every parsha, and again, you have to have the, the Sefer of the Jews, meaning our Sfarim, our Torah. I don't know if you ever noticed, but at the end of every parasha, we are told the number of psukim that that, number, that, that parasha contains. So if you, if you flip through Parashat Nitzavim till the very end, at the end of Parashat Nitzavim, you're going to see that it says Mem, the letter Mem, which stands for Mem Psukim, that there are 40 Psukim in that entire parasha. Oh, now, now, now that's exciting, right? Because 40 is one of the programs, and it's the program for the majority of us, for the Benonim. Okay, let's move on to the next parasha. Flip the pages, Parashat Vayelech. Let's see how many psukim are in that parasha since Vayelech is, is right after Rosh Hashanah and before Yom Kippurim. And to our utter amazement, I don't know if you're looking, but it states at the end, Lamed. Lamed psukim. 30 psukim. I, I, I'm asking you, how excited do you think we should be when we see this? 30 psukim is the 30-day program that tzaddikim gmurim, that the wholesome righteous utilize. And by the way, you should know that there are no other parashiot, at least not in Sefer Devarim, that are 40 psukim long or 30 psukim long. Only these two parashiot. That in itself is amazing. And it's incredible that these parashiot fall out during the Yemei Haddin, during the Days of Judgment, that consist of the numbers 30 and 40 of the, that represent the two regiments of Tshuva. Now, as you can imagine, we cannot stop there. So let's move on to the next parasha. Flip through the pages now. Parashat Ha'azinu which is following Yom Kippurim, but right before Sukkot. And to our utter shock, it says there at the end, Nun Bet. 52 psukim in that parasha. As are my dear friends, when I saw this, I was dancing the Kazatska in my house all by myself. I could not believe it. 52 psukim represent the 52 day program for the late shoppers that ends by Shemini Atzeret. Well, I want you to notice how the Torah is alluding to the, all the different programs. It's beyond amazing. It's prophetic. But then I thought to myself, wait. What about the 122-day program that ends on the eighth day of Hanukkah? Where would I find that in the Torah? 
And by the way, I think it's amazing that I haven't even begun to quote you any psukim yet. And we're only discussing numbers and look how much we could learn. The Holy Book of Hashem not only reveals lessons through the text, but even the amount of psukim tell us something. Anyhow, I was thinking, let me check the parasha before Rosh Hashanah, which is Parashat Kitavo. Why that parasha? Because that's the parasha where in it we find it should never fall upon us, the curses and all the graphic depictions of gloom and doom. I wanted to see how many psukim are in Parashat Kitavo. And would you believe that Parashat Kitavo contains 122 psukim? 122 is the amount of days in the final program. And guess what? One of the psukim that we recite on the night of Rosh Hashanah is what? Tichle shana v'kelelotea. We ask Hashem, please end. We want the curses to end with the ending of the year. We always read Parashat Kitavo before Rosh Hashanah because we're telling Hashem, Hashem, all these curses that we're reading now, please allow them to remain on last year's account. Let this year end with all those curses behind us so that the, the, the week that begins Rosh Hashanah, we could start with a brand new slate. We want to turn over a new leaf. We want Rosh Hashanah to be what? Tachel Shana v'bichoteha. We want the new year to begin with blessings, not curses, God forbid. Ladies, do you know why Parashat Kitavo is the parasha that mentions the 122-day program? Because when we read all those curses, we're unfortunately reminded of this past year and all the tragedies and all the troubles that befell Am Yisrael and the entire world at large. So Parashat Kitavo is a reminder that many of the catastrophes that plague our people and the entire world is due to the fact that we don't take advantage of those 122 days. The 122 psukim in Parashat Kitavo is last year's hajbon, last year's account. We're reminded as we read the parasha that we had a chance to correct the situation and to bring a salvation, a yeshua. We're reminded that these, these days were ones of teshuvah, where we could have done more in order to create blessings in the world. But because, sadly, we don't utilize the days of repentance properly, we do see those curses of parashat kitavo coming to life. So we have to utilize these days of awe to make the proper efforts so that this coming year should not be, God forbid, like last year. And that's dependent on each and every one of us. Now, interestingly, on Rosh Hashanah, on the day where the entire world is being judged, the zodiac of the month of judgment, which is Tishrei, the zodiac sign is a scale. According to the Gentiles, it's a scale as well. They don't know why a smack in the middle of September they have the symbol of the scale, but we know that it's because in Tishrei, the entire world is being judged. But if you open up your machzo, the prayer book that we use for the high holidays on Rosh Hashanah, you'll notice that there is no mention of the word sin. Avera, avon. We do not clap al chet on Rosh Hashanah. There's no vidui, there are no confessions, no chatati, aviti, vepashati, none of that. There is no reference of tshuva, of repentance. So I ask you, what then is the focus of Rosh Hashanah? What are you praying for on that holy day? Believe it or not, one of the things that we pray for on Rosh Hashanah, and the main thing, is for Mashiach. The tefillot on Rosh Hashanah spell it quite clearly for us. We dive into Hashem and we say, 
ובכן תן פחדך השם אלוקיך על כל מעשיך. Please השם let the entire world have reverence for you, they should fear you. ואימתך על כל מה שבראת, instill your awe on all your creations. ויראוך כל המעשים, and all of your handiwork should have reverence for you. וישתחוו לפניך כל הברואים, and all your creations should bow down before you. ויעשו כולם אגודה אחת, and let the entire world come together as one unified force. For what purpose? לעשות רצונך בלבב שלם. To do your will with a full heart. We ask Hashem for a united nations, so to speak. Not the united nations that we have today, which is corrupt. We pray to Hashem saying, we want a united nations under the leadership of Mashiach. We say, וכן, And when that day finally comes, tzadikim yiru v'yismachu, the righteous are going to see and they're going to rejoice. V'yesharim ya'alozu, and the upright will be merry. V'chasidim berina ya'gilu, and the pious will sing with such joy. V'olata tikpatz piha, and all the evil will finally be silenced. וכל הרשעה כולה בעשן כעשן תכלה. And the evil will dissipate and it's going to turn into ashes. כי תעביר ממשלת זדון מן הארץ. And once all the evil governments are eradicated from the world. ותמלוך אתה השם אלוקינו מהרה לבדיך על כל מעשיך. Then only you, Hashem, will reign over all your creations. And once you are the only king, Sasson Leirach, there will be joy in our city, the city of Yerushalayim. Vesimcha Learzach, and happiness throughout the land. Utsemichat Keren Leben David Avdecha. And then the power of David and his dynasty will finally be elevated. And then the light of Mashiach will manifest itself in the world. This is the thrust of Rosh Hashanah. We proclaim Hashem as the one and only King. And we ask that He reveal His glory and His kingdom in this world. and finally proclaim himself. We tell Hashem that we're ready because Chachamim tell us that when Mashiach comes, the shofar of the world is going to be blown and the entire globe is going to shudder at its sound. The shofar will be the instrument of Mashiach. It's not going to be a banjo, guys. It's not going to be a piano. It's not even going to be a kino. It's not even going to be a violin or a harp. The instrument of Mashiach is going to be a shofar. So we tell Hashem that we're ready. Hashem, just give us the signal with the shofar, and we're going to be ready to usher in a new world order of Mashiach. Please send us the descendant of David HaMelech, Alav HaShalom, who will redeem us. That's the main theme of our tefillot, of our prayers on Rosh Hashanah. That's the main objective. We want the entire world to recognize Hashem as the Creator. Now, and then what do we say? Every human being who has a living soul within him will say, Hashem Eloke Yisrael Malach. Hashem, the God of Israel, is the King. And He will rule with sovereignty over the entire world. That's the goal. We are asking Hashem to give us the signal and we will start tuning the shofar. 
My dear students, this Rosh Hashanah should not be like any other Rosh Hashanah. Let me tell you some events that took place. In 1917, shortly after World War I, the Hafez Chaim Shalom gathered all his students, all his Talmidim, and he made a prediction. He said that as a result of World War I, we have now entered the final phase before the coming of Mashiach. And he referred to that phase as Ikveta de Meshicha, the footsteps of Mashiach. This is the last leg, my dear friends. And then the Chafetz Chaim died shortly before World War II after he predicted that tragic era as well. He said that World War II was also the process that will ultimately lead to the final redemption. And that means that we are now at the bottom of the ninth and the game is almost over. A number of years ago, Rabbi Zon, one of the students of the Chafetz Chaim, who heard him predict these world events, woke up one morning and publicized a dream that he had where the Chafetz Chaim came to him and told him that we are very close to the redemption and that people should know about this dream. The Chafetz Chaim wanted Rabbi Zon to inform everybody so that they could mend their ways because the end of the road is near and the Galut, the exile, will soon come to an end. Now, just in the last 15 years, we saw amazing world events that we wouldn't have believed. The stock market crashed, leaving world-famous companies that existed for over 200 years with nothing. One day we woke up and there was no Lehman Brothers, there was no Bear Stearns. From one day to the next, they all disappeared. Capitalism came to an end. Then, we witnessed communism, which was in existence for 70 years, crumble before our very eyes. We woke up one morning and we read about the fact that communism was abolished. That's exactly what we recite in our tefillot. The wickedness is going to be pulverized into ashes. That is exactly what happened. The Russian communist regime went up in smokes without any warning. Slowly but surely, all the isms of the world began to fall apart at the seams. And I tell you that there is only one ism that will prevail, and that's Judaism. Not capitalism, not communism, not atheism not transgenderism or any other ism. The collapse of all these ideologies has already fallen apart before our very eyes and will continue to collapse. You should say amen to that. I don't know if you paid attention, but, but, but every time something shocking took place in the world, the reporters kept saying, what happened today was unprecedented. Uh, by the way, unprecedented means that, that those events have never happened before. All these events were reported as being unprecedented. And when analyzing these world-affecting events, we have to take a step back and realize that this is not normal at all. But let's put Rabbi Zone's dream on the side for a moment. Let's put the collapse of capital, capitalism and communism on the back burner as well. What we should pay attention to is the following. The Galut, the exile we're currently in, began with the destruction of the second Bet HaMikdash by the hands of the Romans, the hands of the Kingdom of Edom, which we know are the descendants of Esav. And we've been under the auspices of Malchut Edom for 2,000 years. 
But our Rabbanim predicted that at the end of days, the final battle in this Galut is not going to come from the Edomim, who we know is most of Europe and the entirety of North America. So let's go back to Parashat Chai Sarah for a moment, that's in Bereshit. At the end of that parasha, we are given the names of the children of Ishmael. Ishmael, as we know, is the father of the Arab world. He had 12 children. I'm going to read the psukim to you so you have an idea of what I'm about to tell you. Listen to the words. Bereshit. Perek Chavhei. The 25th chapter, Pasuk Yud Gimal. 13th verse. And these are the names of the sons of Ishmael. By their names, according to their births. Bechor Ishmael, the firstborn of Ishmael, Nevayot, was Nevayot. Then we had Vekedar, Veadbeel, Umifsan. Some of his oldest were Kedar, Adbeel, and Mifsan. Okay? By the way, it's interesting to note who Kedar was because the Rambam, Rabbi Moshe ben Maimon, Allah Shalom, informs us that Muhammad was the descendant of Kedar. But what amazes me is that David Amelech, Allah Shalom, in Sefer Teilim, wrote the following Oy Ali, woe to me, Kigarti Meshech. For I have sojourned in Meshech. Shachanti, I dwelt among who? Im Ohalei Kedar, the tents of Kedar. David Amelech talks about the tents of Kedar through divine inspiration. The Ruach HaKodesh, David saw the future times and he says, Oy Ali, woe to the generation that's going to suffer from those who will descend from the tents of Kedar. Imagine that. David HaMelech saw our generation. He saw the Ohalei Kedar. He saw the challenges that we are living through and the pain that our nation is going to suffer under the hands of Kedar's descendants. Even Bil'am HaRasha, the, the evil sorcerer of the Gentile world, saw the future generations at the end of days. And what did he say in Sefer Bamidbar? He said, Oi, alas! Who can survive these things from God? Meaning, who's going to be able to live in this generation where the people of El are going to dominate? There are only two nations that have the word El in their names. Israel, as the Jewish people, and Yishmael, the Arab world. Even the great anti-Semite Bil'am said, Oi, woe to the nation that's going to be under the domination of Ishmael. This is the Kedar that we're talking about, the son of Ishmael and his descendants. And then, at the end of the parasha in Sefer Bereshit, the Pasuk states as follows, Al pnei kol echav nafal. Before all his brothers, he will fall. The Torah Hakadosha, the Holy Torah is predicting that Bachrit Hayamim in the end of days, Ishmael will fall. Al pnei kol echav nafal. And what's the next pasuk after that? Ve'ele toledot Yitzchak ben Avraham. And these are the generations of Yitzchak, the son of Avraham. The Holy Balatur Shalom comments on this Pasuk and he says, Lomar, these Psukim are coming to teach us that when Ishmael will finally fall in the end of days, Yismach ben David Shehu Mitoldot Yitzhak. That right before Mashiach comes, Ishmael must fall. Once he falls, that's going to activate the words Ele Toledot Yitzhak ben Avraham. That's going to activate the Mashiach's arrival. Now that's interesting. For all these years in the Galut, the Arab nations were not even the main players. We, we, we thought we have to deal with Edom, 
with Europe, right, with America. But now, as the clock keeps ticking, we see that in the end of days, it's Ishmael that's going to be the threat. And you don't have to take the Rabbanim's word for it, by the way. Just look at what's going on in the world. All the world leaders are scratching their heads, wondering what they're going to do with this new world order of Islamic fundamentalism that's swooping the world over. And if you heard my previous lectures, you also know that the kingdom of Ishmael is very vast. Very vast. According to the Gaon of Vilna, it includes Persia and Russia. But the good news is that they're going to fall. And when they fall, Am Yisrael is going to be redeemed. At the end, we are going to prevail. But listen to the next piece of information because it is important that you know this. At the end of Parashat Vayelech, which is in Sefer Devarim, the Pasuk tells us what is going to occur in the end of days. Moshe Rabbeinu Alav Shalom says, Ki adati, for I know, achrem moti, that after my death, ki hashchet tashchitun, you will surely become corrupted. Am Yisrael is going to corrupt itself. Vesartem min haderech, you're going to veer off the path, asher tziviti etchem, that I commanded you. Vekarat etchem hara'a be'achit hayamim, and in the end of days, evil will befall you. Lo alenu. Moshe says that Am Yisrael is going to suffer because we provoked God. The end of days will be a very difficult uh, time period for us, for everyone, for all of us. And the challenges we're going to go through are actually going to be used as a wake-up call to repent. Interestingly, the word vekarat, and it will happen, it's written only four times in the entire Sefer Torah. Whenever we see a word in the Torah that rarely makes an appearance, we have to analyze the psukim in which that word appears. So, the first pasuk that this word appears in is actually in Sefer Devarim with the pasuk that we just mentioned. Vekarat etchem hara'a be'achit ayamim. And the evil will befall you in the end of days. You know where the second pasuk appears and what the pasuk states? The second pasuk is in Sefer Bereshit. You know what the pasuk states? Vekarat shemo Yishmael. And you shall name him Yishmael. That's very interesting. Rabbanim explain that there's a connection between these two psukim. In the end of days, Vekarat etchem hara'a. The evil is going to befall upon us, unfortunately. In what way? Vekarat Shemo Yishmael. Yishmael will be one of our greatest challenges in the end of days. But don't worry, don't worry. Because you know what the third pasuk states? It's a pasuk from Sefer Yeshayahu that states the following. Vekarat et Shemo Immanuel. And you shall call his name Immanuel. Immanuel means God is with us. And what's the fourth pasuk, which is also found in Sefer Yeshayahu? Listen to the words. Vekarat Yeshua Chomotaich. And salvation will come to the walls of Yerushalayim. That's the progression. The evil will be called upon us at the end of days. The evil will come at the hands of Ishmael. But then Hashem was going to be with us, Immanuel. And ultimately the walls of Yerushalayim will be rebuilt. My dear friends, this is not a theory anymore or something that's going to happen years from now. Based on world events, we know that these events are imminent. This time period is unfolding before our very eyes and the challenges have been predicted over 3,000 years ago. It's my feeling that this coming year 
will usher in many events that will be unprecedented in the history of the world. We're going to be entering into a time period of uncertainty. And that's a bit frightening. So listen to what I'm going to tell you now. The Gemara informs us that there were seven barren women in the history of our people. Sarah Imenu, alayha shalom. Rivka Imenu, alayha shalom. Rachel Imenu, alayha shalom. Lea Imenu, alayha shalom. Hana, the mother of Shmuel Hanavi, alayha shalom. The Shunamit woman who had a run in with Elisha Hanavi, alayha shalom. And the mother of Shimshon Hagibo, alayha shalom. These are the seven women who suffered because of their inability to bring children into the world and they are considered the classic examples of akarot, of barren women in the history of Tanakh. But then the Gemara tells us that there's an eighth akara. There's an eighth barren one that has to be added to that list. Who is that? The Gemara says, Ima Tzion, the mother Tzion. Who is this Ima Tzion? That's the city of Yerushalayim. The mother Tzion, Ima Tzion. Yerushalayim used to be so fertile. There were children playing in her fields and there was life in her city. There was a vivaciousness of spirituality felt in the air. But then, as a result of the exile, the holy city of Yerushalayim was destroyed and it became barren. That's what we read in Sefer Yeshayahu. Roni akara lo yalda. Sing, you barren woman who has not born. The city of Yerushalayim was also called an Akara. She became bereft of all her children. This is the eighth Akara. We have a minhag, we have a custom that at every wedding we recite several berachot, several blessings under the chuppah. A wedding is a momentous occasion. We're celebrating the idea of fertility because this couple is uniting not just to live together, but also to bring children into the world. We're so happy for this couple that we bless them with the following words. Sameach te samach. You should be happy, but not a regular happiness, a double happiness. Sameach te samach. We want you to have the happiness that Adam and Chava experienced in Gan Eden before the sin. We're showering this couple with the greatest berachot, with the most beautiful blessings. But on the night of the wedding, where we celebrate the fertility of this couple, we're also reminded of the Imat Zion. We stand in front of the Chatan and Kala, in front of the bride and the groom, and we recite the following bracha. Sos tasis v'tagel ha'akara. May the barren one, Yerushalayim, rejoice and be happy. We tell the couple, although you're beginning your life with the knowledge that you're going to have many children, hopefully, Tonight, you also have to remember the Akara, the barren one. Bekibutz baneha letocha besimcha, at the ingathering of her children to her midst, in joy. We tell this dear couple, we pray that we'll experience that time when Mashiach will come and the children of Zion will return to Yerushalayim with great joy. We tell the Chatan and Kala, you should be happy, of course, Sostasis. But, Baruch Ata Hashem, blessed are you, O God, Mesameach Tzion, 
bebaneha. He who gladdens Zion with her children. We ask Hashem to bring happiness to this couple, of course. But we also ask Him to please bring happiness to the mother Zion, to Ima Zion, to please see to it that the mother Zion, that Yerushalayim, is reunited with her children. On Rosh Hashanah, we're going to hear the holy words from the Sefer Torah. We're going to read the Haftarah about two of the barren women. Sarah Imenu and Chana, Shmuel's mother. Interestingly, we're also going to read about Yishmael on Rosh Hashanah. Since Rosh Hashanah is the holiday, the Chag, where we daven for Mashiach, we read about Yishmael because in order for Mashiach to come, Yishmael is going to be the key player at the end of days. And this Rosh Hashanah, I want you to listen very closely to the words that are going to be read from the Sefer Torah. You're going to notice that Sarai Menu makes a heartened plea to Hashem. It's a plea she made over 3,000 years ago and we could still hear her voice resonating in the air. Sarah begs Avraham while making her plea to Hashem and she says, please Hashem, garesh ha'ama hazot, drive out this handmaid, ve'et bena and her son, throw this nation out, Please be rid of Ishmael because he doesn't belong in our land. Oust him because he has no place in our country. Garesh. On that day, as Hashem is gearing up for the final geula, for the final redemption, Sarai Menu is pleading with him. Throw him out. Garesh et ha'ama. And our rabbis tell us that that plea is reawakened every Rosh Hashanah. Sarai Menu is davening, is praying for Ima Tzion. One Akara knows the pain of another. Therefore, on the day that we pray for redemption, where we're asking Hashem to reveal Himself, Sarai Menu also petitions Hashem and asks Him to banish Ishmael because we've had enough. We went through so much pain and so much suffering already. Am Yisrael has experienced those 98 curses in Parashat Kitavo. So, that's it. We want the curses to come to an end. We want this year to be blessed, a blessed year, and that all the curses should dissipate. We want to experience a year of Tichlesh We want to feel the ultimate blessings from on high. We all want blessings, whether we're those who use the 30-day program, which belongs to the Tzadikim Gumurim, the Wholesome Righteous, or whether we're from the 40-day program because we need more time since we're Benonim, we're mediocre, or if we unfortunately stretch the repentance time to 52 days until Shmini Atzeret, and, and even if we're sadly the last-minute shoppers who need 122 days until the eighth day of Hanukkah in order to receive atonement, it doesn't matter right now. It doesn't matter right now. We, we, we all want to feel a year of stability, of prosperity, of hope, of miracles, because unfortunate, for unfortunately, the world has become a very fragile place. And it has become a very volatile place. Things that were so stable years ago have suddenly become unstable. Things that were so expected have frighteningly surprised us with the unexpected. We are living in an uncertain and clouded time period. Therefore, we need to wake up. Because anyone who uses his common sense can draw the same conclusion that our Chachamim did all those years ago. Even the Gentiles realize that something abnormal is taking place in the world. And that has to speak to each of us individually and as a nation. What to do and how to do it is not what I'm addressing in this lecture. Why? Because, in all honesty, every single 
one of us knows the deficiencies in our own communities and what we need to do about it. Uh, each one of us knows our own sins, our own indiscretions and how we need to repent concerning them. And if it's a woman, each woman out there knows her personal circumstance and what she needs to do to repair the damage. And, and we all have to rectify as soon as possible. What I'm here to tell you is that now is the time to do tshuva, to repent. Ishmael, you don't realize, is rearing his ugly head. And every day we feel the curses that plague our people. But Baruch Hashem, thank God, there is going to come a time when Ishmael will fail and fall, as predicted, in the Sfarim HaKedoshim. And then, the descendant of Yitzhak, the Mashiach, will come. But in the meantime, we have to repent before that time. Because once the Mashiach reveals himself, it might just be a little too late for us to jump on the bandwagon and experience the miracles because we're not going to be able to change our mind or change sides once Mashiach comes. We're not going to be able to survey the scene and once it's all over and the Jews are victorious, we're not going to to run to the winning side and join the team. Think about what that means. So the time to do tshuva and join the nation is now. However you join. And so many of you have been joining. And even though, you, you know, those of you who are remaining in, in your status as Gentiles, but at least you're becoming righteous Gentiles. You're, you're becoming Gentiles that are what? That are, that are not practicing idol worship. You've stripped yourself from that. And more than that, you're fulfilling the prophecy that Be'ezlat Hashem Esav will come to the aid of what? Of his brother, finally. Which means what? You'll be the supporters of Torah, and that's what you're doing. Every time you click on the donate button, and you donate for the cause of what? Preserving Torah, maintaining Torah, teaching Torah, spreading Torah. You're doing a tremendous tikkun for Esav. And that's going to be a merit for you for what? To survive the period of the Mashiach. Which is not going to be such a simple time period. So you're doing incredible things. And of course, all of the Jewish people out there who are Baruch Hashem also trying to cling and, and do whatever they can to hop on board while there's still time. And I plead with you, don't wait too long to rectify. When Mashiach comes, there are going to be many Jews who abandoned the Torah at some point in their life or twisted the faith to, to suit their lifestyle. And those people are going to wake up. And they're going to say, oh, what, what do you mean? I, I, I love Judaism. I, I love Torah. I love Hashem. I, I want to live in Israel. I always knew that the Mashiach would come and that we'd win the battle. Oh, oh really? <laughs> but yesterday, we didn't hold from the Torah. Yesterday, you argued and claimed that the way you live is perfectly fine. You don't want anybody to interfere with your, your, your life. Yesterday you were alright with living in the corrupt galut and you refused to make your way to the Holy Land because of all the excuses and justifications you had out there claiming you'll move either when Mashiach comes or when you retire. So what happened? Makara, Makara, what happened? Chachamim tell us that it's incumbent upon us to react according to the times that we're up against. And even though Am Yisrael ultimately will prevail, if we want to be part of that victory, it has to be founded on truth, on the truth of Torah. Therefore, more action has to be taken to correct, to rectify. So on Rosh Hashanah, I can imagine Hashem saying, wait, you, you, you put all your sins on the side. You didn't even speak about repentance. You didn't talk about your sins or asking for forgiveness. And the one thing, the focal point of your prayer was that you're asking about my revelation. You put all your personal needs at bay. And the only thing that concerned you on this day of judgment 
was that I should reveal myself to the entire world? Wow. Wow. In this zechut, in this merit, I'm going to forgive you for your avonot, for your indiscretions, because you're davening. Your prayer is a selfless prayer. You're putting your own issues aside, and you're more concerned about my glory, about the glory of God. That alone has the merit to redeem you. Let us together as women on Rosh Hashanah hear the pleas of Sa'ai Imenu. Let's fine-tune our souls and not only come closer to Hashem, but find a way to bring Hashem closer to us. Let's do as many, let's be involved in as many righteous deeds as possible, which you're already doing when you log on to ohalsara.com and you click on the donate button and you're donating for the preservation of this holy organization. And please continue to do so because we cannot survive without you. And Be'ezrat Hashem, when we will all do our part, when we correct our ways and come back to the road of authentic Judaism, HaKadosh Baruch Hu will return us to our mother Tzion. The Akara, the barren one, will finally rejoice. We'll be able to lift up the shofar and the sounds of redemption will resound around the entire world as we usher in the era of Mashiach. Just like the great Hafez Chaim professed in his dream, this galut, this exile, will come to its final end. So now I want to do something that I usually do in my live events. But since I decided to give this shiur here in front of the camera, and I know that I'm reaching such a wide audience from across the globe, and I don't know where you are, but, 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 Let's now create something that's called a poal di mayon. It's an action that we do here on earth that, boom, inspires the heavens above to respond to us. Now, I don't know where you are in the world as you're watching this. You know where you are. But wherever you are and whatever you're doing, stop for a moment. I want you to stand up right now. You're sitting, stand. You're standing, continue to stand. You're in your car driving, pull over to the side of the road and stand up and show Hashem. You're standing up for what? To show Hashem you're ready for Mashiach. Stand up and out of your chairs if you're on Hashem's side. You have to show Hashem you're on his side. Stand up if you want to see Yerushalayim and the mother Zion rejoicing. I want you to write to me, by the way. I want you to write to me in the comments or in the email to me. Email to me, whether on YouTube, Torah anytime. Email me at Ohel Sarah. That you stood up for the honor of Hashem. That you stood up for the redemption. And there's that Hashem. If we all be if we all merit, we will see the pasu coming to life. May we merit that our eyes should see your return, O oh God, to Tzion with mercy. Baruch Atah Hashem. Blessed are you, O oh God. Hamachazir shchinato Tzion. He who will restore his divine presence to Tzion. And may it be soon in our days. Amen ken yehiratzon. Oh, you didn't need to ask her, and they don't be that they call.